Good morning. So we continue our journey through Exodus. And if you were here last Sunday, you remember we talked about Moses being on top of the mountain, talking to God when all of a sudden something was wrong, right? And the something that was wrong was that the Israelites were on the bottom of the mountain sacrificing and worshiping the golden calf, which is the same thing that they did back in Egypt when they were under slavery and depression. Well, as you can might imagine, that made God a little upset. And because of that, and because of their sin, the relationship was changed. And that's where we are today. The relationship was changed. Because of what they did, because of their sinfulness, and because of their desire to go back to worshiping false idols, the relationship that they once had was broken. And so what happens then is Moses is pleading on behalf of the Israelites for God to show mercy, for God to give grace to the Israelites. Even, hello? <laughs> yes, Lord? <laughs> even though Moses had not sinned, and even though Moses did not worship the golden calf, he was still punished because his relationship had changed. He didn't sin, but he had to pay the price for his people. He didn't sin, but he paid the price for his people. Does that sound familiar? So because he paid the price for his people, we know that the relationship that he had with God was very informal. Conversation. They talked. They shared. It was a perfect relationship. But because it changed, a lot of things had to happen. Well, one thing that happened is because they couldn't keep the law, God said, well, we'll send down another law. It's called the second law. Does anybody know what that was called? Give you a hint. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy was a book of the second laws. A lot more things had to happen, a lot more rules, a lot more expectations, because they weren't living in harmony. Instead, they were going back to living in a life of slavery and rules and dominance and power and authority. So what were the changes? Well, the first thing is, before they worshiped the golden calf, every family was a priesthood. Every family was part of the priesthood. Every tent was a tabernacle. And every father was a priest. That changed. And we know from Deuteronomy that now, because of the change in relationship, there was one high priest, who was Aaron, and his lineage were priests, only priests, and there's only one tabernacle. Relationship had changed. And then after that, the priest could only go into the tabernacle once a year on the Day of Atonement. And do you know what they sacrificed? A calf. The calf would be sacrificed. Its blood would be poured out on the altar as a reminder of where they came from. A reminder of their sin. A reminder that they had returned back to Egypt. A reminder that they went back to the sin and the oppression and the slavery that kept them. And Moses had to try to be the interrary to God. Isn't that depressing? I mean, do you feel a little depressed? Like I do. Jeremiah talks about the fact that before this happened, God was like a husband and Israel was like his bride. It was a marriage. It was a marriage of love and grace and perfect harmony. And afterwards, it became one of power and dominion. But God's greatest attribute, God's greatest mercy is his mercy and his love. His grace is everlasting. His love is eternal. So God wanted to go back to a place of unity and harmony with his people. So now we see 
what was to call it actually the second Moses. Jesus Christ comes, born from the Virgin Mary, God incarnate, to once again stand in place for the sins of his people. And he takes on our sins and he goes to the cross as the final and the perfect Passover lamb. To be the final sacrifice. Here's the thing about sin. Sin is not necessarily a list of do's and don'ts. We really like to make it that simple, don't we? Well, if you do this, that's a sin. But if you don't do that, that's not a sin. In fact, friends, what sin is, it's a break in relationship. It's when something isn't right in relationship. It's a gap. It's a lapse in our hearts. And sin is that disease in our life, that spiritual sickness that can grow. And there's got to be a cure for it. And the cure came through God's own son, Jesus. I want to read you something that the Apostle Paul wrote. Now, I know we're Episcopalians and we don't get too excited much. <laughs> but this ought to get you excited. Because I might just get excited with or without you. Here we go. Ready? This is from Galatians chapter 4 from the Apostle Paul. My point is this, heirs. As long as they are minors, are no better than slaves. Though they are the owners of all the property. But they remain under guardians and trustees until the date set by the Father. So with us, while we were minors, we were enslaved to the elemental spirits of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave. Do you get that? This is going right back to Egypt. You are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. Because of what Christ did, we have been rejoined back to harmony. We have been rejoined back to relationship with Jesus Christ, with God his Father. We are once again back in unity. The relationship is back renewed. The sins have been forgiven and we have been reconciled and restored. We aren't slaves, but we become the very children, the very daughters and sons of the risen Savior. Very sons and daughters of God. Does that not get you excited just a little bit? I mean, it's okay. You know, somebody said you want everybody to say amen. God's not deaf. Well, God's not deaf, but he's not nervous either. It's okay to say amen once in a while. Amen. There you go. Amen. Here's the thing. God sent Moses to Egypt to declare to Pharaoh, let my people go. So that they would be released to worship God. To enjoy a relationship with God but we sinned, and the law couldn't be kept. But Jesus Christ came, died on a cross, and I believe that as he laid in the grave, he went down to the very pits of hell. The earth on top was silent and quiet. The earth stood still wondering, what's going to happen next? Is he going to stay in the grave? But while there was wondering and questions, Jesus went down to the pits of hell, looked at the devil once and for all in the pits of darkness, and said, you let my people go. And he took the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And at that moment, we have been restored in wholeness, in purity, in relationship with Jesus Christ. Our sins have been forgiven. Your past is your past, and it's been washed away. Our sins are buried in God's sea of forgetfulness because we are his sons and daughters. So what do we do about it? What lessons do we learn? Don't let your past dictate your future. God's not done with you yet. 
His son is still interceding on your behalf. And I imagine that Christ is probably talking to his father saying, yep, I know they're dumb, but they're mine. And when we go before the throne of God, God is not going to see us in our sinfulness. God's not going to see us in our failures or in our faults. But rather, God is going to look and see the righteousness of his resurrected son. And that ought to make us shout and rejoice. It's like the song, here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down and say, you're my God. Not the gods of Egypt, not the gods of this world, but you, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. We have been set free. Our sins are forgiven and washed away in the blood of the Lamb. Amen.